being here. Uh, I'm, I'm here to talk about the electrical optical flying leads that ODI has supplied us in uh, 2016. But I'm going to talk about Vision Networks Canada first um, as, a, as part of that. Um, this is a, a great uh, model that NOAA, or excuse me, NOAA, NASA put together, um, the ECHO 2. It's showing the currents and eddies around the Earth. Oh, and the microphone, I'm sorry. Is that better? <laughs> sorry. Anyway, it's a, it's a great model. Um, Oliver Streets on, uh, on Monday talked about uh, we're all connected to the ocean. And uh, um, this is a, a definite graphic showing that uh, the ocean is connected to us. Uh, and we are learning more about it. And the, the data from satellites that's producing this, as well as uh, the other data from observatories around the world, are adding every day more to our knowledge of the oceans. Um, this graphic as well uh, is a cartoon, basically, of the Earth and our oceans. And it's showing the global conveyor. So a little molecule of water in the conveyor floating in the ocean. It takes 1,600 years to do a full rotation back to where it started. Um, we don't really know that the bathymetry of the oceans is what is shown here because we've mapped very little of it. Um, we are learning more, and as we learn more, it, it scares the heck out of some people as they start to understand. I, it scares me when I start to think about, I have a house in Florida, and uh, it's on the beach, and it's probably not going to be there in 20 years. Um, again, great graphic. Closer to home, uh, Daryl referring to it last night, uh, about a little less than 20 years ago, a uh, few scientists at uh, AGU in uh, San Francisco had a little bit too much one night and sat around and started talking, hey, we could do this. This would be really cool. So um, what this is was just a, a sketch on a napkin, and it's basically a cocktail napkin. It's basically what they said they came up with this thing. And it was a combination of Canadian and U.S. scientists. That 20-year-ago idea morphed into what we get today, which is Ocean Networks Canada's observatories, the, the Venus and Neptune, which Venus started um, two years later, um, Neptune. Yeah, so in 20, 2009, um, Neptune came online, 2007, Venus, which is the inshore work and uh, in the Straits of Georgia, and Neptune being the offshore work. Um, the, since then, okay, Ocean Network Canada has expanded further. Our, our president CEO, uh, Kate Moran, says uh, we're plotting to take over the world. Um, we've expanded to community observatories along the British Columbia coast. We're now also operating in the Arctic. We're operating on the east coast of Canada. And on our data management side, we're handling data from NOAA now. And uh, we're actually, this year, starting, uh, I'll get to further along, ingesting other data. Um, specifically with the Neptune Observatory, that's where I, I started with ONC. Um, we've got an 815 kilometer uh, cable which starts in Port Alberni, does a giant loop. So it starts back where it finishes, uh, it gives us redundancy. If there's a break in the cable, uh, we can back paddle and, and transmit and receive data and power. Uh, the opposite way through the loop of, of what it is. So at these different node locations that you see, we have a spur cable branching off from the main cable going to an instrument node. And then from the nodes, we have cables going to uh, specific instruments and instrument platforms. Um, why we're located there is it's a subduction zone. Um, if uh, global the uh, tectonic plates, the Juan de Fuca plate is one of the smallest of the global plates. Uh, so we have instruments on both sides of the subduction zone at the ridge in uh, uh, Endeavor, and then we actually have instruments now on the Pacific plate itself. So we've got three different global tectonic plates with instrumentation on all three. So it gets to give us uh, a lot of information 24-7. Uh, 
Um, the 24-7 is uh, fiber optic cables coming from the instruments back to the University of Victoria. And as was mentioned by Daryl, all our data is accessible 24-7, 365 days a year. It's open source. Anybody can go on and look at it. Um, the instruments we have are varied. Uh, it depends on location. Um, this one, talking about hydrophones, we have hydrophones uh, and seismometers, sonars, uh, CTDs, ADCPs. We have uh, Wally R crawler, which is in a hydrate field. I'll show you another picture of Wally in a minute, but um, that's actually controlled by a, a team in uh, Bremen, Germany. They uh, proposed it and it's now part of ONC. So it's just a picture of some of the stuff. And what you're going to start to see is a lot of our technology is Teledyne Marine, different, uh, different companies. Uh, day one with us, we certainly started working with ODI about our underwater natables. Um, the Nautilus connectors of ODI, uh, the first time they were ever used, I believe, in an application. I can be corrected on that by Michelle, probably, was with ONC. Um, our instrument platforms, this is one of our platforms uh, that was newly deployed. Um, so this is as it, it came down. What's involved in these deployments is a lot of, uh, it's a, a lot of work. It takes us um, pretty much the entire winter. So we're getting into that now. Um, you'll see the oil-filled uh, PBOF, pressure balance oil-filled cable from ODI. Uh, on the cable there. We're uh, in the process now of refining how we do some of these operations with the underwater mateable cables. Um, the, uh, as the technology's gotten better, uh, certainly with the ODI equipment, it's highly reliable for us. Uh, we've adopted a change in trying to be more efficient in how we do all of our operations. Um, I, I should note that ONC's mission is not to do science. We are there to provide the avenues for scientists to conduct their experiments. So we do have scientists on staff, but uh, the over 200 scientists that are actively participating with different experiments and programs that we have right now, um, they do not work for ONC. They're affiliated with various institutions uh, nationally in Canada as well as globally. Um, it's, I figured I'd put this in just to give you a sort of feel. This ROV was a very small ROV on uh, one of our Coast Guard ships, and uh, they were actually having a problem with one of their arms, as you'll probably see here. But it's just, you can see it's one of the ODI 12-way uh, mateable Nautilus connectors there. Other things we do. Uh, this is uh, tsunami uh, detections. We have bottom pressure recorders. Um, we have an array of them out there. Um, this, uh, this was, of course, looking at the uh, Japan uh, tsunami back in, what was that, 2013? Um, we recorded it. So at our sites at, at uh, Cascadia Basin and Clayoquot uh, Slope and then in Barkley uh, and then right into Folger Passage as that wave came in, uh, we're partnered with the province of British Columbia now on earthquake or early warning systems as well. We're doing a lot of uh, additional installations of seismometers and accelerometers both on shore now. So Ocean Networks Canada is working on land um, as well as offshore. Um, we collect a lot of data. Um, this is now going to be wrong after this year. As I say, we are now starting to ingest all of the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans data into our Oceans 2.0 system. But basically, we've got over, well, as you can read through it, over 100 million data manipulations per day. It's, it's a lot of information. So all that's stored, all of that is accessible to anyone at any time. So it, uh, it does give you a large advantage over a deployment that's an autonomous deployment. Um, having it on the network, um, it helps. Um, the other part of ONC is we get to play with a lot of really cool things. It's the short period seismometer. Um, 
the, the things that you get to see and be part of on a daily basis there is, is amazing for me. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky to be part of the organization. Um, every day something else. This is a bottom pressure recorder. Um, as they indicated, uh, we have these as part of our tsunami warning system. We're also uh, um, deploying them now. There's a, a, a new uh, a newly developed system that we're also working with on the earthquake early warning uh, with bottom pressure recorders as well. Um, Wally, the crawler, uh, there's actually two Wallys um, uh, so that we can swap them out as spares. Uh, Wally is in a gas hydrate field, so um, on the bottom, I, I assume everybody's probably familiar with uh, methane hydrates, but um, they're frozen down there, and the area where uh, Wally lo is located, uh, the terrain, I, I, I equate it to, it's almost like a, a pimple appearing one day on the surface. So you'll get a bubble sort of form that a mound of earth will grow up, and then it'll basically erupt and then collapse on itself. And then a week, month, two months later, another month may appear somewhere else in there. Mapping that constantly on a daily basis, Wally has a, a 75 meter path that he goes out and does a little tour and comes back. And uh, they've been operating that now for five years. Um, and we've only lost it twice. <laughs> <laughs> Wally's problematic. I had deployments with Wally one year, we had it, uh, um, it unlatched the surface and fell, free fell. It's in 800 meters of water. And it actually deployed exactly where we wanted it to go, <laughs> right uh, upright, just perfectly deployed. And, uh, and then uh, in 2016, a, a similar thing happened with the, the latching bail broke on it and uh, uh, due to some welding issues with the titanium. And it also fell exactly where it needed to go. The biology out there is amazing, um, and we get to see it on a daily basis. This is gas hydrates on the back deck of, uh, that was on one of the Coast Guard ships. Uh, the captain was not happy with us. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why, it was really cool. It was like, look, you can hold it in your hand. It's, um, yeah, he wasn't happy with us on, on that particular day, but it did, uh, it, it, was, it was interesting to, to play with and, and fun with. Uh, we have methane seeps. Uh, when we get into, um, talking about the methane and the gas hydrates that gets into the whole uh, climate change discussion, uh, ocean acidification, um, and we're studying these seeps with sonars. Uh, we actually in one place have cameras um, and watching the bubbling and what's going on uh, with them and the increasing in some areas as the hydrates become unstable and they enter as gas into the water column. Um, the big area, of course, uh, for us that is one of the most, I think this is the highest studied subsea location on the planet is the Endeavour Field. More scientific expeditions have gone there than anywhere else. Uh, it's conveniently close. Um, and we have these uh, black smokers. Um, on Tuesday, or excuse me, on Monday, Pac talked uh, in his presentation, he had Godzilla, well, we have Godzilla. Um, the, the names of uh, some of these um, different uh, hydrothermal vent areas uh, range from high rise. There's s and which stands for smoke and mirrors, uh, Bambi, uh, Mothra, and Godzilla. We have at, uh, at high rise and Mothra, we have uh, what you saw going in. There was a, a temperature probe that uh, is, was developed by the University of Washington, APL. Um, it gets mounted into uh, one of the vents and records 24-7 uh, temperatures in there, which are generally over 400 degrees. He won't let us, uh, if we probe a, uh, a hole and we don't get the temperature to 400, then it's, uh, he doesn't like it, so we have to find another hole. Um, and as uh, you're all aware, the finding of these Vents back uh, at the end of the last century in the late 1900 or 19, it was early 1990s, I think. Um, that was Bob Ballard. Um, that changed our perception of 
life on the planet, knowing that you could have life where there is no sun. Um, near shore, we have coastal radar systems that are looking at surface currents. Um, this is off of uh, Vancouver, between Vancouver Island and the mainland of Vancouver. Uh, we've increased our coverage in the Straits of Georgia. This was when we had two locations. We now have four locations uh, working with the port of Vancouver on um, what you're looking at with the, the surface currents is for the port. They're interested for oil spill and uh, search and rescue. Uh, but there's other applications that it's being used with with the Fraser River Delta area. Um, and we've expanded that, those as well. We'll be putting uh, two more in the Juan de Fuca Straits this winter. And hopefully the US is also going to be putting some in on the US side. So the Juan de Fuca, which is one of the busiest uh, waterways in the world uh, will hopefully have complete CODAR coverage in another year. Community engagement, this is up in uh, uh, Cambridge Bay in the uh, Nunavut in the uh, Arctic Circle. Um, this was a, uh, an idea that came out of a, a meeting, uh, it's called Arctic Net, um, and uh, ONC volunteered me and my team to uh, install an observatory in Cambridge Bay, but uh, as the uh, scientist who volunteered us for it, who was on ONC's team, said, oh, it only cost you $20,000. Uh, airfare for four people to Cambridge Bay is $20,000. Um, so, but it's growing. The observatory there, again, it's, it's plugged in. Uh, we spent another probably $250,000 on it this year, upgrading it. Um, it's, uh, it sits beneath the ice the majority of the year, and in the summertime, uh, in late August, early September, when there is no ice, we service it. But it's really, it's captured the, the minds of a lot of the locals uh, in Cambridge Bay, which is great because it's a, the new generation of scientists who are, are going to, um, you know, they'll be doing my job. Um, staying on the, the subject of scientists, uh, as I said, all of our data and all of our video is uh, available on the internet 24-7 worldwide. Uh, Ukraine, uh, back in 2013, uh, a student, 14-year-old, uh, uh, Kirill Duko, is this his name. And uh, he was somebody who enjoyed uh, watching our videos online. So um, he was watching, uh, in real time, this video, if I can get it to play. Uh, that's a hagfish, ugly, slimy, eel that you never want to touch in your hands. And he sent an email in. He said, I was watching this video, and I saw this, this fish sitting there over. That's a, a pipe just to give you a distance measurement. And he suddenly saw that. And he said, what is that? And uh, this site is in uh, almost uh, 800 meters of water. And it turns out it's an elephant seal. They, they tell me it's a female elephant seal. Uh, nobody had recorded uh, seals feeding at that depth before. Um, what we discovered, and we adjusted accordingly, was uh, these cameras turn on and off. On, uh, they were turning on and off on a set schedule. So we wouldn't turn the lights on 24-7, but five minutes every hour on the hour sort of thing. So the local marine life there, aquatic life, got to know, oh, the lights turn on, and these little fish get attracted by the light, and then the little fish are good food for the bigger fish, and then the bigger fish like the bigger fish, and it was, you know, it was like the big neon sign, dinner's, dinner's on, and they, they, uh, they became habituated to it. Um, the cameras are now on a random, it, it, so you, it, other than some of our um, near shore cameras, which they get the natural light, um, it's not like you can just go on right now and, and well, you can see the schedule, but um, the cameras aren't turning on exactly at the same time every day because um, it kind of ruins the science if you're putting bait traps out, which is basically, basically what we were doing. Um, that's all on the science. I'm on the engineering side. Uh, I am an engineer. I'm not a scientist. Uh, the challenges of uh, Neptune uh, more, more so than Venus, but the uh, subsea work, as we all know, is, is very challenging. 
Um, it's a hostile environment. Uh, Endeavor, uh, the deepest part of Endeavor is almost 2,700 meters, but average is around 2,300 meters. Uh, it's cold, oxygen poor. Um, it's in places down there, the, the surface is like razor blades of very sharp rock. Um, it's not accessible. It's very expensive for us to go out there. I'd say to people, um, a dollar a second is what, with a big ship, not one of our Canadian Coast Guard ships, but one of the UNAL ships with uh, the ROPOS, which is the uh, Canadian ROV kit on board, uh, with our satellite equipment and the staff on board. It's a dollar a second, so uh, it's not cheap. Um, and we've had many, many challenges over the years. And one of the challenges uh, back in, uh, when I first started working at ONC in 2012, uh, we laid six cables in 2012. Of the six, five of them failed. That's not very good, especially when we talk about a dollar a second and the cables are costing you about $300,000 each and the terminations on each end of those cables cost us over $50,000 each. So in 2012, as I started my new position, I watched us blow probably about four and a half million dollars out the door um, because they failed. Um, and I said to the, uh, uh, my bosses and actually to our board, we need to take a step back and figure out what we're doing that's wrong that we need to fix. And one of the things what we were doing that was wrong was we had and don't take this wrong if you're a scientist, but we had scientists telling engineers what they had to do. Um, so I said, let's go back to engineering basics, okay? And, and let's go to tried, tested, and true commercial methods. What works for us? Um, our ODI connectors work for us. Um, there's companies who lay cables all over the world on a daily basis. Uh, we had partnered with Alcatel originally. Uh, in 2016, we partnered with TE Subcom, with ODI, and uh, um, putting on my other hat, uh, conflict of interest with the, uh, the EV Nautilus and uh, Bob Ballard's group. So we had cable ship from Global Marine, uh, which uh, we're in a, a consortium of cable owners on the, in the Pacific Ocean that pay for the cable ship to be on standby. We chartered the cable ship we chartered Nautilus and we laid some cables. We had four cables that we laid in 2016. Um, of the four, uh, all of them, well, the, the shallowest was in 1,300 meters. The other three were all out at Endeavor, which was tough, tough terrain. So this was an armored cable, uh, whereas the other cables in 2012 were not armored. Um, so we, we spent more money to do what we did in 2016. Um, the reason why we did it was because I wanted a guarantee that it was going to work. If we kept doing what we were doing, where in 2012, if you looked at the history of Neptune, uh, the failure rate on cables was almost 50% overall. They, they, it was trial and error, learning by mistakes, and you can't do that with the kind of money that we're spending. So TE Subcom has, or and so on, is a sales pitch for competitor here in some ways. Um, they have these giant mud mats at the cable end. Um, it's very tight ship operations. That's the cable ship, and that's the bow of the Nautilus. Um, cable, when you lay it sometimes, if you're not laying it properly under tension, you end up with a kink in the cable, uh, which the first cable, that, or excuse me, the second cable that we laid uh, in 2016, we did have, uh, they went slack, and that was happening. The ROV had to go down and actually unwrap that, take, get the kink out of it, which they did. And one of the mud mats at deployment. And the reason why I'm showing you the mud mats is uh, at two of our locations, uh, the cables were intermediate cables. So they were, um, we had a cable, uh, a new cable we ran from a node to an instrument platform. And then at that instrument platform, we were then running another cable uh, at one location over the uh, west ridge of Endeavor to the Pacific Plate. Um, this cable is fiber optic and power. Um, at our instrument platforms, uh, 
were going to copper. So um, the mud mats then were going back to fiber optics. So we had to have a solution in there to go back from copper to fiber and then at the other end from fiber back to copper. And who could do that? The, the subject of the conversation today, the Teledyne ODI, uh, said, well, we've got this. We got you covered. Um, the advantage of this was, uh, well, there was a lot of advantages to it. it. It gave us the ability to be able to plug in the mud mats with the fiber directly into our instrument platforms and flexibility between. At uh, the location I just spoke to you about on the Pacific um, plate, we weren't going to be putting an instrument platform there originally. Uh, next year, we will be putting an instrument platform there. So in the interim, at each end of that cable is one of these flying leads. So one end has so what we call a 12-way plug. So it's got 12 pins on it, and it's plugging into one of our instrument platforms. Um, the other end is fiber optics plugging into um, uh, plugging into the mud mat. This should actually play. Um, so this is the actual deployment. This is what's called a tool basket that we bring everything down in. Um, and that's one of the flying leads. So uh, we just mounted it on a, a little grating. Uh, we put a, a, on the end, you can't really see, is a small, um, sorry, I've got volume on here. I really don't want to hear. Um, I think it's, oh, there. Perfect. Thanks, Darren. Um, to, be, to be able to then plug it into the instrument platform on one end, and at the other uh, end, the, uh, the mud mat that you saw has a ODI 50 meter hybrid connector, uh, PBOF with a hybrid connector on it, um, and plug it in then the other end with, with that. Um, this particular location, because uh, the cable is typically 400 volts DC, uh, the other end, it, we stepped it down to 48 volts DC. Um, and that gives us, again, the flexibility in, in two of the locations to have these, but then in the future to be able to disconnect them and move them somewhere else if we decide to, uh, for instance, which we will now be doing next year, is putting in an instrument platform at the far end. Uh, we did have the stormtrooper mounted on there. They guard our platforms. Um, my guys every year kind of put something out there to keep everybody uh, keep everybody on their toes, and just in case we do get rogue ROVs down there playing with our gear, um, which, believe it or not, somebody actually did say that once. They said, well, you know, you could have the, an ROV go down there and unplug your gear. Um, the plugging in of uh, the, these connectors, these underwater mateable Nautilus connectors, um, is uh, it's interesting. It's, uh, it looks simple. It's frustrating if... Uh, if you're sitting or watching an ROV pilot try to do it and he's not successful at it, um, I offer they're, they're out there in the hallway. You can see them. Uh, these ones are the older style, which have these little latching tines that go in that you actually have to see. It's very hard to watch when they connect. Um, ODI has developed uh, the gross alignment funnel with uh, the latching and indicators, which are these uh, four pins just pop right out. Um, so it's been a progression and a partnership over multiple years um, between ODI and ONC to, to get to the level of being able, and I'm sort of running over a bit, but um, this was uh, Jason uh, Woods Hole's ROV team, and uh, he actually dropped that in the mud there, which you're not supposed to do. But uh, the skill set involved in making these connections is, is it's pretty amazing that how some of the guys can do it brilliantly. Um, this guy, other than the fact that it, it fell, he, he gets it in there on the first switch very quickly, very easily. Um, I, I should say the, uh, all the four cables that are out there are working now. Uh, we don't have the failures that we've had in the past. We're going to be laying uh, two more cables, hopefully, um, in 2019. I was hoping to lay them next year, but budget not that great to be able to do that because it is an expensive undertaking to do. I'm, I'm stalling now just to let him actually get this plug in. Um, but I will move on to conclusions. So 
the electrical optical flying leads that were installed at four locations are functioning perfectly. So it was a good decision for us to go that way. Um, they're flexible and can, can be modified to fix the specific customer requirements as we required at you know, the two ends of one of our cables. Um, Teldyne Marine staff has continued to support our mission since day one. Um, John Flynn uh, knows, he's forgotten more about uh, ONC than I will ever know. Um, we are working to maintain our, our role as leaders in cabled observatories and Teledyne Marine is not just a partner but is really part of ONC at every level from the ADCPs with RDI to the work with uh, ODI and all the other 23 different companies of Teledyne that contribute towards our daily. Um, that's it other than the video at the end. This is the Sekuliak, uh, University of Alaska's new ship. We were on it. The captain actually was sitting right there, um, very young guy, but uh, we asked permission if we could take our, one of our drones out, and he wanted to confirm that it was one of our armed drones. So this is not one of our predator drones, but just one anyway. Uh, and that's Jason, of course, going in the water. This is one of the rougher days we had out there. Uh, uh, seas uh, pretty much in you know, the Northeast Pacific, pretty calm. Um, you know, not like down here, you get waves, you get surfers here. We don't really get a lot of surfers up there because the, there's no waves, as you can see. Um, we've been very lucky with uh, some of our expeditions with sea states like this, but it's not always that way out there. But uh, um, that's a little bit of ONC and something about ODI and their electrical optical flying leads. Thank you. Teledyne Marine. Everywhere you look.